I want to know, and I think a lot of people do also as well, uh, what com compared to other parts of the country, I mean, what separates Dallas? What makes Dallas different? Is this the primary thing that sets us apart, or are we, uh, wh where do we rank nationally in, in what we're doing and what sets us apart from, from other? Uh, Whew, um, that's an interesting question. One of the problems for Dallas is that it has been out of the circuit of a lot of, of the arts. Um, it has been somewhat isolated on the prairie. Part of it was the, the origins of the Dallas Theater Center with Paul Baker. Paul Baker had a unique vision, but it was an unconventional one. It did not use professional equity actors. He believed um, that actors, uh, that any artist learned from having access to do anything, to try out all these things. And so he had his actors work the box office, you know, paint sets, do anything. Um, and equity basically said, you can't do that. This is the union rules. And so they didn't have professional actors. So for the longest time, Dallas Theater Center did not have uh, contact, in effect, with the rest of the theater scene. Uh, and Dallas has been, before the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, Dallas was somewhat isolated. And people would, would uh, come here. Uh, you, would get, you still get the reports as if they were on some sort of caravan and just discovered the place. Um, <laughs> but the increasingly, some of the things that, that uh, have marked Dallas, um, that bode well for Dallas. Um, this is kind of the good side of the churn I was talking about earlier. There's a marvelous book uh, called Cities and Civilization by Sir Peter Hall. He's a, a British urban specialist. And what Hall does is he examines those cities that took off culturally at different periods of time. And we can all know them. Uh, classical Athens, um, Renaissance Florence, Elizabethan London, Paris in the late 19th century examines all of them and just why. Why did they do this? How did they do this? Then he examines those cities that took off industrial, economically. Uh, Manchester, England in the Industrial Revolution. Detroit with the audio industry. Hollywood. And he examines why they did that too. And at the end of the book, he uh, sort of assembles all this data and he examines um, why. And, and there were several things that struck me very, as very interesting and very relevant for, for Dallas. One is, Throughout history, in almost every one of those cities, the major players came from out of town. Almost any big name you have from classical Athens, Aristotle, Eurip Euripides, Sophocles, uh, Diogenes, Aeschylus, they're all small town boys who came to the big city. Elizabeth in London, Ben Jonson and John Webster are the only ones we know for sure came from London. Shakespeare, small town. Christopher Marlowe, scholarship boy from Canterbury. Beaumont and Fletcher, small towners. They all came. The, the idea that, that Shakespeare couldn't have been Shakespeare, couldn't have been who he was because he didn't, he, suddenly he becomes this guy who has access to royalty and is, and is a, uh, a major theater producer, that notion that um, there are alternative Shakespeare's, is a profound misunderstanding of Elizabethan London. Uh, the generation before Shakespeare, the two most powerful men in England were Cardinal Wolseley and Thomas Cromwell under Henry VIII. Both of them came from dirt. Thomas, uh, Thomas Cromwell's father was a pub keeper and probably a borderline criminal. Uh, and these were the most powerful men in England. So yeah, Shakespeare could come from a small town and make a success for himself because in each of these cities, what happened was there was a breakdown. The old hierarchies broke down or there was some sort of basic schism that they were at war. And so there were opportunities broke open. People could make a name for themselves. In Paris in the, the 19th century, there are a number of Parisians that we know, Manet, Monet, um, Degas. But a lot of the other Impressionists and the literary writers of the scenes, small towners, or even Pissarro. Camille Pissarro is from the West Indies. Picasso, of course, is Spanish. Um, Cezanne, small town. Van Gogh is not even French. Um, same thing with uh, Flaubert, uh, Hugo, Balzac. They're all small towners. They all came to the big city. So that kind of folk tale that, we, that we'd known for years of the, the person setting up to make their fortune in the big city, that is literally true throughout history, and it is still true. Remember the migration I talked about? Young people coming to the city to make a name for themselves. That's significant because that's where you get new ideas from. This is confirmed. Uh, Peter Hall's dense research is confirmed by, in a more pop fashion by Steve Johnson's book, Where Do Good Ideas Come From? And he points out that one of the things that where good ideas come from is not from people who associate with the same type of people all the time. That that's one of the purposes of a city, is to rub different people together and all have to figure out how to survive and prosper. And so sparks fly. Things happen. And, and the, that clearly is Dallas, love of the new, young population, continually replenished, 
those are all good things to a degree, even as it provides, it provides this kind of shifting sand basis. The other thing that's very good uh, that w bodes well for the future is connectivity, not in the internet fashion, but Dallas-Fort Worth. It generally helps, Hall concludes, if a city is a day's flight from the rest of the world, and we are. And that's a huge advantage. It may seem like, again, internet changes everything. It doesn't. Some of the biggest business deals are still made on golf courses and over drinks in a bar. It's still face-to-face. -face. And particularly when you're talking about the live arts, performing arts, museums, things like that, a lot of times when artists come here um, and they have an exhibition at the museum or a gallery, it's the first time they've seen their artwork in the gallery like that. But they know the, the head of the gallery by name. They've met that person. They know that person. So it's still a kind of hands-on relationship. Those things still matter. And that kind of connectivity of being able to do that all over the world. You can fly here in a day and we can set things up. That's an incredible advantage for us. Let's talk a little bit about the venues. Um, with the Meyerson opening back in 1989, you consider that just a, a huge event in Dal on the Dallas art scene. Because so explain it, why. Well, it signaled to, it, it signaled to, it, to a new generation in a way of people that a, the, a building like that could make a, a giant difference. Um, people forget that uh, for all the impressive force and presence that the Dallas Symphony has in terms of the society in Dallas, high society in Dallas, and in terms of business, in the 80s it was bankrupt. It was, there was a real question of whether it was going to fold. The Meyerson saved them. The Meyerson really helped turn them around. Dallas has actually has done this several times before. People often look at the Arts District in this, and they talk about Lincoln Center as the model. Um, but actually, Dallas did a similar thing before Lincoln Center, and that's the Kalita Humphreys Theater. That was empty land for the most part. Dallas plops down Frank Lloyd Wright Theater, and a lot of those old, the old condo towers rose up Afterwards, it was the, the land suddenly, as it did with the Arts District, suddenly took off for the developers. That kind of public-private deal is very Dallas. It's now considered very new, very inventive, very novel, a really cool way for a lot of people to get around certain problems that they've been encumbered with. Dallas did it, you know, in 1959, 1960. Um, but the Meyerson was the, the, the real first sign. I mean, the, the Dallas Museum of Arts building was uh, the first big thing in the Arts District, but, no, but it didn't really take off the way the Meyerson did for, for the symphony. The, one of the difficulties for the Arts District has always been, um, and the Meyerson sort of proved it, and that is that because we do not believe in government interference of any sort, government control, when the city created this, they abdicated any coordination. So the arts organizations pretty much realized every man for himself, we're on our own. That's why there was pretty much, you know, they'd just design anything and plop it down with no little concern about what's going to happen next door, what are the other arts organizations doing. Um, it was, we raised the money, we got the land, we got the designer, we're doing this, we control this. Um, and it's, it's perfectly understandable they would do that. They were on their own. The city wasn't giving them any help. Uh, they provided the land. That was the big help. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we have the vitality of the arts district all this money, all this fascinating architecture, all this newness, all this energy, but it's also why the Arts District is never going to be a real urban neighborhood, I think. Um, the, I've sort of reluctantly come to that conclusion. I've always wanted it to be something like Lincoln Center where there is a real urban neighborhood, but in the tradition of Dallas, we wiped out any sort of neighborhood there. And I don't think we're ever gonna, there's never gonna be enough residential anything in there to make it into some sort of neighborhood, even with the, the major purchase of the last piece of land, you know, where the, the liquor store is and all those parking lots north of um, the Plaza of the Americas, the, the Marriott Hotel, that whole chunk of land there has been bought up and they have a mixed use development going in. But I mean, how many millionaire condos can there be? I mean, how many millionaires are gonna live in the area? Is that gonna really make a real neighborhood? Mm -hmm.